Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody this morning. Glad to be here. Well, today, um, this is going to be a very special message. Today, I'm glad those of you that are here are here, and um, welcome all of you who are joining us online. Um, this has been an extraordinary week uh, for me, and I'm going to talk to you uh, more about that a little bit later, but it's, it's been one of those weeks uh, that I don't have very often. It's, in fact, I haven't had an experience like this in many, many years, and um, it's a, it, it was a life-changing, life-altering, trajectory-altering uh, experience that I had this week. And I believe it's go- going to alter um, my life and my ministry. And I believe it's going to alter the course of this church. Um, so uh, I'll get to that a little bit later. But before we get to that particular part in the message... Uh, we need to finish up. We've been on the, la- the last two weeks, we've been talking about the woman at the well. And I want to finish that up because it, it dovetails just perfectly into what um, I want to talk about today. Uh, today's message is called What Happens When We Share. What Happens When We Share. So let's pick it up where we left off last week. Many of the Samaritans. From that town, believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them and to stay, and he stayed two days. I'll just go ahead. This elephant in the room, this is cut off here, and we're just having a few technical problems. Who knew that upgrading your TV on stage would cause so many problems? But it has. I should just just stuck with the old television. You wouldn't know the difference, would you? Because you couldn't see behind it that there was duct tape holding it on to the stand. <clears throat> so, so Jesus altered his plans. I told you last week that God's will is interactive. He altered his plans when they urged him to stay with them. And so he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became Believers, Because of his words, many more became believers. And this is what they said to the woman. I love this. They said to the woman, the woman at the well, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. We don't believe just because you said it anymore. We, we believed it at first that this might be the Messiah because you shared With us, we believed, and we came out to see him, but now we have our own testimony. I like that. And that's the way it works, isn't it? You come because somebody invites you. You come because somebody gives you their story. You like their story, and so you you become interested, and you think, maybe there might be something to this Christianity. Maybe there might be something to Christ. But then whenever you come and whenever he touches your life, whenever he speaks to you, you don't need their testimony anymore because you have your own testimony. That's the way it works. Amen. I love it. I love it. So what happens when we share? They believe because we share and God rejoices because they believe. This is so true. They believe because we share. I I believe today because someone shared with me. I believe because someone shared with me and God rejoiced because I believed. And now I'm sharing what I know. I'm, I'm showing the, I'm sharing the Christ that I know and because I'm sharing that other people believe and when they believe God rejoices because They believe. So as I told you before, this has been an extraordinary week. I knew that I was going to deliver 
a message today that was going to be the end of this vision casting um, series, and we, you know, we thought we had it in the can. We we came here uh, Tuesday to our planning meeting, and and we talked about the message, and we we talked about um, the different points of the message, and we had a, a plan that we were going to. Um, that we were going to, to do some special things here in the service. And, and it got me thinking about a question that I've been asking for a long time. And as I pulled out of the parking lot here out front onto Clinton, I asked God a question. This is the question that I've been thinking about. And I asked God this question. I said, how do you feel about the lost. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I asked that question. Because I was going to be talking about the lost today. And, and I asked God, I said, how do you really feel? How do you feel about the lost? And the reason I asked that question is because I have a friend, Ray Hutchison. He's been here several times and preached. And uh, last time he was here, I was here too. I like to, I like to stay, hang around, stay Watch him fill in for me. Um, and so he said it during that message. And uh, I was in his men's group recently. And he said it again. And this is what he says. He says that God hurts. He hurts for the lost. He talks about when we sin, we hurt God. And just to be real honest with you, I didn't know if that was true or not. Um, because I've read what, what theologians have written. And, and one of the ideas about whether God hurts or not, one of the ideas that I have pretty much subscribed to is that God is so big. God is God. God is Do you realize what that means? I mean, you think about the universe and, and you think about the creator himself coming to this planet to, to speak to us and to reveal to us who he is. And you think about, that's the same God that made all the, all the stars and all the planets and all the black holes and you know, all, that, all that stuff. It's so Big, it's so big we we can't even fathom how big God is. And so I I was asking that question because I didn't know could, is it possible to hurt God? Is he is he so big and so great that he can't be hurt because he's God, or does he really hurt over us? And so I asked him that question as I was leaving the parking lot. I said, Lord. How do you feel about the lost? And let's just, I'm just going to lay it out on the table. I have never really felt much of a burden for the lost. I have felt more of a burden for the, the, the Christians that I know in churches. I, my burden has been, hey, we, we, we've, got to, uh, we've got to straighten out a few things in the church and, and we've got to get back to the heart of Christ and what Christ originally taught. Because I don't see that being taught very much. I don't hear many people teach what Jesus actually taught. They teach other things. But I, I wasn't hearing that. And so that was my burden. And I never had really thought too much about the, the quote, lost. Although there are a lot of people in the church that are lost. We know that. And so I asked God that question as I was leaving the parking lot. And I thought about it, going home, I was going over the mountain. And then I, then I got a phone call and I got distracted and, and then I forgot about it. And I got home and Lene was coming home too. She had been in, in the meeting and she was coming home also. And so we got home and I was, uh, we were sitting there eat, eating supper and I said, uh, I, said I don't feel right. And she said, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. I said, I feel heavy. 
She said, well, what, is, what is that? What, what do you mean? I said, I feel, I've got this lump in my throat. And I said, I, I feel weird. I feel strange and I feel heavy. And she said, is it emotional? I said, yeah. I said, I know you've had some trouble with, um, with depression. I said, I described my symptoms to her. I said, is this depression? She said, that sounds like depression. And so as the night wore on, it got worse and worse. And uh, that night I went, went to bed and I dreamed that night that I had lost my, I had lost my first love. And I was grieving so much on the inside that I wanted to confide in someone. I wanted someone to console me. I needed something from someone, but I, there was no one that I could tell. And I woke up in the middle of the night a couple of times, and I went back to sleep, and I'd go right back to that dream. And I, I, I needed consolation. I needed someone to help me. I needed someone to console me. But there was nobody. And so that morning I woke up, and it was even worse. And I thought, okay, uh, it's time to get very serious about prayer here. So I prayed, and I, this was kind of the prayer. I was like, Lord, uh, I either need you to help me or I need to go to the psych ward or something. I mean, it was like, it was like that. Because I hadn't felt that pain since for decades there was, there was only one other time in my life that I'd felt that kind of pain. And it was when my actual first love left me. And that's what brought me to Christ. If you've been around long, long enough, you've heard me talk about my testimony. And that's how I came to Christ, was I lost my first love. And, I, and it was everything to me. I mean, all my hopes and dreams and future, everything, were tied up in this relationship. And when, when she left, I lost all of that. And... I felt that kind of heaviness. I felt that kind of um, despair. Have you ever felt that? It was despair. And, and so I prayed that prayer. I said, Lord, what is this? What is it? And then he began to speak. And he said, why do you think, why do you think I brought you to me through that experience? Why do you think that was? And I said, God. I said, is this what you feel about a lost person? And what he was telling me is that was the way he feels about every lost person. Who knew? But love demands vulnerability, does it not? And vulnerability subjects you to pain. Mm. And in you might think, like I did, how can God feel that much pain? And I, I think it's the same way. We have to say it in the same way that we say that, that Christ was the only one who could die for our sins. God himself, the creator himself, the one out of whom all life and all creation flowed. He had to do it. He had to die on the cross for us to pay the price for the sins of humanity. No ordinary man could do that. Not even a special man. Not even a prophet. Not even the greatest man ever born of a woman. John the Baptist is what Jesus said. The greatest man ever born of a woman. Not even he could die for our sins. It had to be God. And so in the same way, this God that is so big feels this kind of pain for every lost person. I want to tell you something. Wednesday morning, when I woke up, I was wrecked. I had a lunch 
appointment with two friends of mine, and I was looking so forward to that. I mean, I was excited about it. I was looking forward to it for two weeks. Can't wait for that Wednesday lunch. I can't wait for it. And I woke up that morning, and I thought, i got to cancel this lunch. I can't go like this. I was, I was destroyed. And I went upstairs to my, my prayer room, and I closed the door, and I locked it. And I was undone. And I prayed and I wept and all of that stuff. And one of the things I said that morning, I said, Lord, I can't preach this. I'll be a blubbering pastor. I preached this on Sunday morning. You're going to have to help me with that. He is helping me. So... I'm sitting there in my prayer time with God alone, and, and the scriptures began to come to me. And this was the first scripture that came to me. I hate that it's cut off, y'all. But now as he drew near, this is Jesus coming to Jerusalem. As he drew near, he saw the city of Jerusalem, and he wept over it. And he said, if you had known Jerusalem, even you, especially in this, your day, this was their day. He came for his people. He came to his own and his own rejected him. This was their day. If you had known even this, in your, this is your day. The blessings that make for your peace, the Prince of Peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will leave you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. That was the time of their visitation. This is not talking about what's going on today, by the way. It's talking about what happened after that. And and, and Israel was, uh, Israel was conquered and destroyed and the city was torn down and, and all of that. And, they, and we look at Israel today and we say, oh, the, Israel's still there. No, they, they didn't become a nation again until 1948. Until 19, 1948. So, this is what happened to Israel, but it's also exactly what happens to the unbeliever. This is, this is the way Christ sees the unbeliever, because, because the enemy, Scripture says, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he absolutely will devour you. Can I get a witness on that? You know what I'm talking about. If he can, he will. So this is why it's so important. And then the next scripture that God brought to me was the three scriptures in Luke that talk about the loss. And we'll save the first one for last. But I want to start with this one. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. This is strange. I mean, this is strange. You have ten coins and you lose one coin. I can understand sweeping the house. I'm, I'm, I'm that way. I live with Lene HDAD Hall. And she's losing things all the time. I'm an expert at finding things. And I would, I would look for the coin, and I would find the coin. If it was there, I would find it. And then I would throw it back in the box and go on my, about my business, right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying that this woman, this strange woman, she... She, re- she calls her friends and neighbors together and has a party over finding the lost money in her house. That's strange. 
Didn't it? It's 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 kind of over the top, don't you think? It's disproportionate, don't don't you think? It's it's like an overreaction. So you find you find the one you had the nine all the time. If I had a thousand dollars and and I had my nine one hundred dollar bills and one was lost and I found the one hundred, I would be glad about that. But I wouldn't call my neighbors together and say, "Let's have a party because I found my one lost hundred dollar bill." They would say, "What are you crazy or something?" So he says this. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God is crazy about the one sinner. He is crazy about the one sinner. He is so over the top in love with that one lost person that you can't imagine. It's like his first love. It's the church to be. It is the bride to be. We are not the only ones. He is crazy about this person. He continues. Jesus, he's on a roll. He's like, I'm going to drive this point home because this is what's important to me. He continued, there was a man who had two sons, the younger said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between the two sons. Now you, because most of you are church people, you probably know this story. So the, the son takes his entire inheritance. He takes all of that wealth in today's Uh, world, it would probably be millions of dollars. And he goes into a foreign land and he, he, he spends all of it on sinful living. We can only imagine what all that is, right? Drugs and sex and all of that stuff. And so he takes the precious, the precious property that his father has given him, that his father earned, that belonged to his father, that And his father gave that to him, and he takes that precious, precious treasure of his father, and he goes and he spends it all on sinful living. And when it's all gone, he's broke. And he finds himself in the pig pen, and he's feeding the the pigs, and he's eating the food that they eat because he's got no other food. And he thinks to himself, my gosh, what am I doing Even the servants in my father's house eat better than this. So here's what I'll do. I'll go back to my father. I know my father's good. I'll go back to him and I will, and he rehearsed what he was going to say. And I'll tell him that I don't deserve to be a son. And maybe he'll make me a servant in his house. And, And at least, at least I'll have food in my stomach and a roof over my head. But. (laughs) <laughs> While he was still a long way off, the father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. What? He's just spent his whole inheritance. I'm thinking about my own sons. I'm thinking, yeah, you, you walk your butt all the way back home, and then you tell me your story. And then we'll have a a strong talk. But that's that's the flesh rob, you understand. That's the the, uh, sinful nature talking there. God is not that way. While he was a long way off, his father saw him. And filled with compassion for him, he ran to his son. He ran to him. He didn't just say, well, I'll forgive him when he comes home. No, he said... I'm going to run to my son. And when he got to him, he, he, he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The son had just done like the worst thing you could possibly do. And he is hugging his son and he's kissing his son. He's running to his son. The son starts to, 
to tell the father what he had rehearsed on his way. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, quick, not, okay, let's have a time of repentance. Let's have a time of restoration. Let's remove you from your position as my son, and let's have a time of restoration and due diligence and all that stuff. No, he says, quick, bring the best robe. What kind of robe? The best one in the house. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast to celebrate. That's strange. And it would be crazy if we didn't know that God was absolutely crazy about us. He is crazy about the lost. Oh. So they're having this party. And they're having this party. And the older son is coming in from the fields. And the father is explaining to his servants, he said, this, is, this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. They began the party. And as the son, the other son, the faithful son, the one who's been there, I'm talking about the Christian, the Christian son. As he comes in from the field, he hears the celebration. He says, what? what's going on? Oh, your brother. He's home. Your brother's home. And, and your dad is throwing him a celebration. Well, he, he wouldn't even go in. The father had to come out to him. And he says to his father, he says, I've been with you all this time. He said, I have never disobeyed you. I've always been faithful to you. I never left you. I never squandered my inheritance. And here, this brother of mine, has gone and squandered all of his, his inheritance on riotous or sinful living. And you throw a party for him. You've never even given me so much as a goat so that I could have a party with my friends. And the father, he says, my son. You're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother, this brother of yours, he was dead and he is alive. He was lost and he's found. God is crazy. He's a little crazy. He's a little crazy. When it comes to his sons and daughters that don't know it yet, he is crazy about them. Now I want to share with you the first parable. The first parable is what changed my life. I don't say that very often. Not many things change my life. This changed my life. And Jesus said to them, he told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 sheep in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Wait a minute. Suppose you have a hundred sheep and you lose one out of a hundred. One sheep out of a hundred. You lose that one. Doesn't he leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Wow. He leaves the 99 in open country and he goes after the one. You might say he's a little obsessed. He's obsessed with the lost. He leaves the 99. That's us. 
And he goes after the one. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Wait a minute. He's not even going back to the field. He's not even putting that one back in with the others. He's going home. Look what I have. I got my lost sheep. He goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and he says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. There's more. I tell you that in the same way there will be more, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Jesus is putting some numbers to it. So this is what I want to leave you with. To God, it's over 100 times more important what we do for the lost than what we do for the found. To God, over 100 times more important what we do for the lost than what we do for the found but that's not what we do that is not what we do we do the absolute opposite of that we spend our time and our money and our energy mainly on the found we build buildings we have worship services we take offerings we have Bible studies we have educational programs in our churches and we spend a hundred times more on the 99 than we do the one and gosh I hate to say it but that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing I was supposed to announce today that we we're starting a building fund I was supposed to. I was supposed to announce it. Many of you have said we need to start a building fund, and, and, and maybe we will start a building fund, but I couldn't do it today. Because maybe what we need is a different kind of fund. Maybe what we need is a fund to reach the lost. Maybe we need to be content with a rental place I don't know this is also new to me it's changed the way I think it's changed, it's changed my heart but to God it's over 100 times more important that we, what we do for the lost than what we do for the found and I think we need to to get a vision of that I really do I think we need to get a vision for the loss and my gosh he's put us here in this building there are thousands of people that go up and down these hallways all week long that are lost as a goose they need Christ they need to hear what Christ has done for us so that they can find him and, and hear what he is going to do for them and so that they can have their own story and so I just started thinking about this this week and I got kind of a new vision I'm telling you it's still new to me so forgive me if you know for, just forgive me what if the net began to put more and more resources into what we do for the lost until we could say honestly that we spend a hundred times more on the lost than the found what if we could do that well if we could do that this is what would happen 
You, if you've been here three weeks, you know what a Christian is. You know what a Christian is. If you've been here three, if you've been here two Sundays, you know what a Christian is. It's someone who hears what Jesus has to say and goes out and puts that into action. That's what a Christian is. It's not, and Jesus told us the New Testament is just full of it. It's on every page. We put our faith into action. We believe, we believe, we believe. And because we believe, we go out and put our faith into action. Do you know in the early church, the only way people got buried is when the church buried them. The church was known as the place where, that was full of good people that did good things. And when your loved one died, the church paid to have that person buried. And they buried them with dignity and honor. That was, that was, that was when the, the gospel was new. That was before we got a hold of it and, and made a religion out of just feeding ourselves so that we can feel good about ourselves. And so you know that's what Christianity is. I don't have to tell you that. But if we were, if we were giving many more times what we have to the lost, if we were giving our testimony, if we were putting on events, if we were doing... Ah, just a hundred different things that we could do to reach the lost. If we were doing that, what do you think would happen to your hearts? What do you think would happen to your souls? A whole lot more than another Bible study, I can tell you that. See, this is the beauty of God's plan, is it not? This is the beauty of God's plan. So my question to you today is, will you help me? There's, there's this thing that a guy that I listen to a lot, Craig Grishel of Life Church, he's one of the good guys. He's a really good guy, and I've learned a lot from him. And, one thing that he says, he says there's first line commitment, second line commitment, and third line commitment. And first line is, you know, you'll come, you show up to church. Second line is, you know, I, I feel good about this thing that I'll, I'll give something. I'll, I'll tithe or I'll join a small group or I'll, I'll invest something in the church. And then there's the third line. The third line is... I give my life to this. And I'm asking you for third line. That's what I'm asking you for. I'm asking you to think about this message when you get home this afternoon and on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and come in, energize next week. And I want you to think about it every time you meet someone. I want you to think about it when you're having a conversation with a friend, when you're having lunch. I want you to think about this. I want you to invite. I want you to, and this is, this is, this is huge. I want you to ask God to give you some creative ideas about how we as a church. You know what I talked about this first week in the series. It's, we are spirit-led, but we are body driven. It's body driven. Everything that we've done as a church, we've done because one of you had an idea. This, this is what we need to do. I believe that if we work together, that God will give us enough creative ideas to reach not just hundreds of lost people. And you know, it's easier than ever. I mean, we can reach people. I can reach 20,000 people through a video on Facebook. I've done it. We can reach so many people with the technology that we have today. And so I, I'm asking you, ask God, give me an idea, Lord. What, how, can, how can I personally reach more people? How can our church 
reach more people. And I want us to third line commitment, commit our lives to this. Are you with me on that? Let's get a little crazy with it. Let's get crazy. Let's pray.